So here we have the autopsy report of Matthew Perry. And the thing about autopsy reports in general is they are extremely valuable and helpful when it comes to learning medicine for two real main reasons. One is that as the years go by, they're becoming less common. And the other thing is that they provide a lot of information that we otherwise wouldn't have access to in someone who is uh, living. So uh, the autopsy is very valuable and uh, it's just a great tool to learn medicine. So anytime it occurs, I think it's a great opportunity for people to learn medicine. You know, with that said, this is a, a case that has a lot of public interest as uh, Matthew Perry, he's a celebrity. Uh, this case is from the Los Angeles Medical Examiner's Office. It's a matter of public record. The beginning of the report starts off with the anatomic summary. That's a 54-year-old male with a history of COPD slash emphysema, so chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. That's almost always a result of long-term smoking. He also had diabetes. This would be type 2 diabetes in this case. We know that based on the medications, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, other past medical history, drug use in the past, reportedly clean for 19 months. As mentioned, uh, not surprisingly, heavy tobacco user for many years, but currently not smoking. On ketamine infusion therapy with the most recent therapy, reportedly one and a half weeks before the death. He was found unresponsive, floating face down in the heated end of the pool. Prescription medications and loose pills present at the residence. However, none reported near the pool and no medications, drugs, or drug paraphernalia adjacent to the pool. No signs of fatal trauma and no foul play suspected. So section two, the autopsy findings. Focal, moderately severe, left anterior descending coronary artery atherosclerosis with proximal to mid portions ranging from 50 to 75% narrowing. No thrombi noted, and there are no acute myocardial infarctions grossly identified. So in other words, the presence of coronary artery disease, but no heart attack. So when you're having a heart attack, what happens is you have a, a thrombus or a piece of that plaque that breaks off, travels downstream, ends up blocking the smaller portion of the artery, the narrower portion, and then you subsequently have piece of or portion of that heart tissue, the heart muscle that dies off as a result of the absence of blood flow. Other findings with his heart, he had mild cardiomegaly, meaning his heart was mildly enlarged, which is not uncommon when someone has high blood pressure, lungs with marked anthracosis and bolus changes. So in other words, basically the smoking caused blackening or somewhat some blackening of his lungs and the bolus changes. That's basically what happens when you have emphysema. Essentially, the smoking destroys the elastin proteins and the lung tissue loses its stiffness. So basically, it becomes more and more like a, a sack, almost like if you think of a plastic bag at the grocery store or like a Ziploc baggie, it becomes very easily distensible. There is also pulmonary edema and congestion within the lungs, which is uh, not really uncommon when someone is experiencing cardiac arrest, which is what happens when people die. He also had nephrosclerosis of the kidneys, meaning hardening of the kidneys. Interestingly, pancreatic fibrosis, that's not really common. Chronic pancreatic fibrosis. Remote abdominal surgery. So he had abdominal surgery at one point with chronic fibrous adhesions of the intestines. So basically on the outside part of the intestines where the intestines overlap and they meet each other on the outside, you can have these adhesions that develop as a result of having surgery. And it's a very common thing that can cause a small bowel obstruction, not to happen with him, but whenever has, someone has a surgery, they usually develop adhesions that can, in the future, cause obstructions in the bowels. Also, with moderately severe aortic atherosclerosis, usually if someone's going to have atherosclerosis in one part of their vascular tree, it's going to be pretty much everywhere. Chronic hepatic congestion. So the liver was uh, chronically congested. There was a mild enlargement of the spleen, mild splenomegaly. And then there's other separate microscopic 
toxicology and microbiology reports in this autopsy report. Noted to have a BMI of 31, so that's class 1 obesity, basically mild obesity. Nutritional status otherwise unremarkable. Mild immersion wrinkling of the hands and feet, so that's what happens when you're in the pool for a longer period of time. Early clubbing changes of the nail beds, so that's interesting. Clubbing is an interesting phenomenon that can occur with various diseases of the lungs. Interestingly, COPD, emphysema is not one of them, but other lung conditions such as bronchiectasis or lung cancer can cause that. Also, conditions that affect the liver. Liver issues can also cause clubbing. Yellowing of the right index nail is seen. That's peculiar. I don't know why one nail would be yellow. The oral nasal passages are unobstructed. There is no foam in the nostrils or in the oral cavity. There is mildly to moderately increased anterior posterior diameter of the chest. In other words, this is what we call barrel chest. That's something that happens when people have COPD slash emphysema. Plural effusions, meaning water that builds up or fluid that builds up on the outside part of the lungs in that pleural cavity. Uh, very small, 50 cc's or 50 mls, both sides. Lots of different things that can cause that, but whenever there's pulmonary congestion or pulmonary edema, you can also get pleural effusions. And in this case, very small. Pulmonary parenchyma is dark red purple and the cut surfaces exude a moderate amount of blood and frothy fluid with the more apical areas showing mild to moderate bolus changes, which is typically where you get the bolus changes in emphysema. The pulmonary vasculature, the arteries within the lungs, they did not have any thromboembolism, so no blood clots there, no pulmonary infarction. So sometimes blood clots that obstruct the blood flow in the arteries within the lungs so that can cause a, an obstruction of blood flow to a certain region of the lung. And uh, when that happens, a piece of the lung tissue dies off, and that's what's known as a pulmonary infarction. There is evidence of relatively severe pancreatic fibrosis with focal calcification. The liver weighed 2,020 grams, is red-brown to a light tan with nutmeg appearance, no evidence of cirrhosis. In the brain, there was no cerebral contusions. Sometimes when someone has trauma to the head, you'll see cere cerebral contusions or cerebral bruises. For toxicology, they took samples of heart blood, so blood that comes from the heart, but also blood that coming from the femoral vein. They also tested the contents in the stomach, so gastric contents. They tested the liver bile. They tested the urine. They also did a CAT scan, and they didn't see any fractures of bones on the CAT scan or any other unusual radio densities. They also made other anatomical notes, toxicology reports. So here's the summary. The cause of death determined to be from the acute effects of ketamine. Contributory factors in his death include drowning, coronary artery disease, and buprenorphine effects. The manner of death is accident, drug, and drowning related. No signs of foul play are suspected in this death. At the high levels of ketamine found in this post-mortem blood specimen, the main lethal effects would be from both cardiovascular overstimulation and respiratory depression. That's what ketamine does. Ketamine is often used by anesthesiologists for when someone has surgery. Also, we use it frequently in the intensive care unit when we're going to require someone to be sedated. For example, when we're putting in a breathing tube and having them on a ventilator, it's a very common drug that we use to induce them, induce the patient to go unconscious. Same thing for ER physicians. They are often intubating patients, putting that breathing tube in, and they want the patient to be sedated, unconscious. Lots of times they grab ketamine. Another setting would be uh, psychiatrists sometimes use ketamine as well to treat anxiety and depression, but not at the same doses as the doses that we use for to induce unconsciousness. So besides inducing unconsciousness, it can stimulate the blood pressure and the heart rate. So blood pressure goes higher, heart rate goes faster, and the respiratory drive, which is in the pons and the medulla of the brain, becomes suppressed, also known as respiratory depression. They go on to say that the drowning contributes due to the likelihood of submersion into the pool as he laps into unconsciousness. So in other words, the thought here being is that ketamine can cause unconsciousness 
but it's unlikely that the ketamine by itself caused his death. In other words, had he not been in the pool, he probably would have been unconscious and slept for a good amount of time and then eventually wake up. And in this case, he essentially lost consciousness in the wrong spot. And being in the pool at that time was really an, in combination with the ketamine causing him to be unconscious. The two of those combined led to his death. They also say that coronary artery disease contributes due to the exacerbation of ketamine induced by the myocardial effects in the heart. In other words, if someone has coronary artery disease at the same time as someone being on ketamine where they are having a fast heart rate and higher blood pressure, essentially the, the heart has to work harder and it has less reserve as it otherwise would in someone who doesn't have coronary artery disease. So it's not really contributing towards a death directly, but more of an indirect exacerbating factor. They also say that the buprenorphine effects are listed as contributory. Even though they weren't at toxic levels, it's because of the additive respiratory effects when present with the high levels of ketamine. In other words, combining the ketamine plus the buprenorphine together, both of those things individually will suppress the respiratory drive but combining them together has more than an add additive effect. It's actually the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So it's no different when someone is mixing alcohol with a benzodiazepine, mixing that with a narcotic. When you start mixing these different classes of drugs together, essentially the whole becomes greater than the sum of the parts. And the effect is to dramatically suppress the respiratory drive. The toxicology testing revealed that the ketamine levels we're at 3,540 NGs per ml, and that was from the peripheral blood source, and 3,271 NGs per ml in the central blood source. They go on to say, for context, in monitored surgical anesthesiological care, levels for general anesthesia are typically in the 1,000 to 6,000 range. So basically, he was right in that range that anesthesiologists give as a dose to induce anesthesia. And basically, same thing when we're inducing someone to go unconscious when we're intubating them in the intensive care unit. Also detected was buprenorphine, an opioid-like drug used in the treatment of opioid addiction, as well as acute and chronic pain. These levels were actually therapeutic for the drug, as well as its metabolite, nor buprenorphine, 8.0 and 17 NGs per ml, respectively. There was also non-toxic levels of benzodiazepine, specifically lorazepam, which is Ativan. So essentially, he had three different things in his system that suppress the respiratory drive. The lorazepam, the benzodiazepine, the buprenorphine, which is an opiate, in addition to the ketamine. And again, combining all these things, it, the risk for suppressing the respiratory drive to the point where you're stopping breathing, the cessation of breathing, that risk becomes very high when you start adding these things together. Interestingly, the metabolite of clonazepam, so clonopin is clonazepam, that metabolite of that is a 7-aminoclonazepam that was also detected in the system. However, clonazepam itself was not detected. Alcohol, methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, PCP, fentanyl, all of these were not detected. Ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic with established human medical and surgical uses. It is also used in recreational drug use and other illicit settings, mainly due to its dissociative nature, indicating disconnection of the mind from the body. It can also have short duration hallucinatory and psychedelic effects. This latter effect explains its use in the nightclub party rave culture. The exact method of intake in his case is unknown. They did find very small amounts of trace amounts of ketamine in his stomach contents. He was reported to be receiving ketamine infusions or ketamine infusion therapy for depression and anxiety. Per the medical examiner investigator's report, his last known treatment was one and a half weeks prior to his death. And the ketamine in his system at the time of death could not be from infusion therapy because ketamine's half-life is three to four hours, if not less. So in other words, the last infusion of ketamine to treat depression and anxiety was a week and a half uh, before his death. And because it only has a half-life of three to four hours, if not less, that wouldn't explain that time gap. 
In other words, he was getting ketamine in his system, not from this IV infusion therapy that was one and a half weeks prior. So it makes a likelihood that he was getting ketamine by other means. The final conclusion is that from the anatomic findings in pertinent history, the pathologist, the medical examiner, ascribes the death to the acute effects of ketamine. Other conditions contributing but not related to the immediate cause of death were drowning, also coronary artery disease, buprenorphine effects, the manner of death was accident, and how the injury occurred, unknown route of drug intake. They don't know how he got the ketamine in the system. Also that he was found in a residential pool. One of the big takeaways and the medical learning points from this is that uh, it's extremely dangerous to start mixing different drugs that suppress the respiratory drive. And there's many different classes of drugs that do this. Ketamine is one of them. Anything that can inhibit GABA receptors in the brain, that includes propofol, as in the case of Michael Jackson. Alcohol suppresses the GABA receptors, so that's another one. Opiates, different mechanism, but also suppress the respiratory drive. Benzodiazepines, similar to GABA, but basically has the same effect as alcohol. It's going to suppress the respiratory drive, especially in combination with other agents. However, he was getting the ketamine. It's a very dangerous drug, and that's why it's a controlled substance, and it needs to be given cautiously, especially when combining it with other classes of drugs that suppress the respiratory drive, such as benzodiazepines, such as opiates. One other interesting takeaway from this is that they list in this report that his primary care physician is an anesthesiologist, and I've never heard of an anesthesiologist being a primary care physician. Primary care physician is almost always going to be either a family practice physician or an internal medicine physician or a combination of, but it's very bizarre to me that an anesthesiologist is a primary care physician. When you think about the doctors who have access to ketamine, first and foremost is anesthesiologists, also would be psychiatrists, uh, although doses that they're given are much different compared to what the anesthesiologists are given. Critical care physicians like myself uh, also have access to ketamine in the ICU, but obviously we don't have any other access to that except when we're giving it to patients when we're about to intubate someone in the intensive care unit. And that same goes for emergency room physicians. Coincidentally, right after this autopsy report came out, there was a new study that was just published showing the benefits of giving ketamine for anxiety and depression. But again, it just has to be administered cautiously, controlled substance. And however he got the medication, uh, I don't know, but it just goes to show that you can't play around with these medications, just like with Michael Jackson when he was getting propofol from his physician.